So I'm pleased and honored to introduce Dr. Derek Pensler, who is the William Lee Frost Professor of Jewish History at Harvard University. Derek got his PhD at UC Berkeley and then moved on to teach first at Indiana University and then at the University of Toronto. And he held the first chair in Israel studies at Oxford University before he joined the faculty at Harvard. Derek specializes in modern Jewish history, uh, Zionism, and the state of Israel. His interests are wide ranging, and his work is comparative and always spans really widely chronologically and geographically. He began his career uh, writing about German Jews, uh, specifically German Zionists, um, with the 1991 volume, Zionism and Technocracy, the Engineering of Jewish Settlement in Palestine. <laughs> Later, together with the well-known German Jewish historian Michael Brenner, he co-edited a very important collection of essays entitled In Search of Jewish Communities, Jewish Identities in Germany and Austria, 1918-33. Next, he turned his attention to how Jews' economic distinctiveness in European history shaped Jewish culture and identity. And this is really where that very broad comparative work began. That book on Jewish economic distinctiveness was called Shylock's Children, Economics and Jewish Identity in Modern Europe. A similar approach was applied um, to another theme, namely Jews' attitudes to war and experiences of military service in a book entitled Jews and the Military History from 2013. His articles and essays on uh, the history of Israel has been published in the volume Israel in History, the Jewish State in Comparative Perspective, as well as in numerous journals. He's the co-editor of the Journal of Israeli History and with Dr. Iran Kaplan, he also edited a recent volume on primary sources the, on the Yeshuv and the early state um, called The Origins of the State of Israel, a documentary history. Um, he's just completed a biography of Theodore Herzl for the Jewish Life series at Yale University Press. Um, and he's working on a, his, a new history of Zionism that he uh, is going to, that's what the research from today comes from. Um, Derek Pensler also serves as the president of the Academy uh, for Jewish Research, and he's been deeply involved in the creation of Israel studies as an academic field. He was the inaugural holder of the Stanley Lewis Chair of Israel Studies at the University of Oxford from 2012 to 2017. So it's my great honor to introduce or to uh, welcome you, Derek, to UT. Um, and we, you'll speak for about 30 to 40 minutes, and then we'll have plenty of time for discussion. Is that about right? Okay, well, it's, it's a little longer, but I can cut that's it. That's fine. Well. No, that's fine. <laughs> okay. um, however so long 45. you want for, but, but there's yeah. a room, uh, oh, yeah. time for question and for answer sure. afterwards. For sure. Yeah. Thank you. Yeah. Thank, you. Uh, thank you, Tatiana. It's, um, there's a Yiddish word, tekfel, which means uh, to tremble with pride, and it's sort of I fell to, you know, when, when students become colleagues. And uh, it's just wonderful to be on your home turf and to be at the other UT, as opposed, I guess there's University of Tennessee also. So there's three UT, so, but I'm, I'm used to U of T, University of Toronto. And it's a great pleasure to be here. It's nice to see so many of you on this beautiful winter day. Uh, this is really amazing. I think it's about 18 below Celsius in Toronto at this moment that I'm going back to tomorrow night. So uh, I'm going to enjoy my time here. So what I'm going to be doing today is talking through with you some themes that run through a couple of the chapters of a book I'm working on, this book that's called Zionism and Emotional State uh, for Rutgers University Press uh, series on keywords in Jewish studies. Uh, and it's um, actually divided up into chapters, one chapter. The first chapter is love, the second chapter is gratitude, the third is uh, fear, then there's guilt, and then hatred. So each chapter deals with an emotion. And this talk kind of brings together little bits and pieces of, of some of the chapters. And it's really a talk about how people define themselves a, a, a group identity. And it might seem very strange for me to be combining Zionism and anti-Semitism, because this is not a talk about anti-Zionism and anti-Semitism. That's not the, the, the topic. It's Zionism and anti-Semitism. To try to understand the relationship between ideology and emotion. That's, that's the real question. 
behind the talk. It's almost using the examples of these identifications, people who call themselves anti-Semites or call themselves Zionists or who have those kinds of feelings. And um, what, how do we explain the feelings or the ideas underlying those terms. And I think that we have to begin with the very concept of nationalism, uh, which people usually call an ideology. But I would call it something else. I would call it a form of emotional self-medication. It narrates uh, a, a community. And that narrative offers, if not a cure, then at least a, a tonic to allay the fear of death. The notion that you belong to a certain nation and that others don't enables and provides shelter from social marginalization or exclusion, which scholars have tellingly termed social death. The nationalist idea also provides justification and rationalization for feelings such as resentment, hatred, anger, loneliness, anxiety, guilt, and shame. Last but not least, nationalism is the continuation of eros by other means. It both co-opts and supplants the romantic love that joins human beings into long-lasting pair bonds and makes possible the continuation of our species. These emotionally therapeutic qualities of nationalism are readily apparent in Zionism. Like other forms of nationalism, Zionism uses ideology to sustain an emotional community united by negative emotions such as, uh, well, negative emotions like fear with positive ones such as hope, love, and pride. Now, Zionism's emotional register has been deeply influenced by the presence or absence of anti-Semitism. Like other forms of racism, anti-Semitism provides an ideological veneer for emotions, such as fear, resentment, despair, and shame. This afternoon, I want to explore the interaction between two powerful affective forces, Zionism and anti-Semitism. Using as a case study, Zionist diplomacy, from the mid-1890s to the early 1920s, that is from the outset of Theodor Herzl's brief Zionist career to the wartime leadership of Chaim Weizmann, uh, negotiating the issuing of the Balfour Declaration. And I want to look at both Zionist and anti-Semitic reactions to these transformational events, possessed of radically different personalities, operating under different geopolitical circumstances, Herzl elevated anti-Semitism into an ideology, whilst Time Weizmann engaged with it as an emotion. Conversely, at first, anti-Semites saw in Zionism a source of emotional relief. But in the aftermath of World War I and the issuing of the Balfour Declaration, they incorporated Zionism into an increasingly monolithic and ominous ideology. So that's the <clears throat> argument that I'm going to flesh out. And I have to begin by defining terms, because the field of the history of emotions that I've been researching and now teaching, often you have people working across service, uh, across purposes. They don't define what they mean by emotion, for example. Well, let's first define ideology. A coherent, sustained interpretation of experience. That's my definition of ideology. In terms of fundamental beliefs and values, ideologies function via logic, both deductive and inductive that is, first principles and empirical observation. They lay claim to rationality, although in fact ideologies need not be rational. This definition goes beyond Marxist or neo-Marxist conceptions of ideology as a belief system of dominant classes reflective of their economic interests. My definition encompasses religion broadly understood and all of the systematic political systems of late modernity, liberalism, communism, fascism. All of these are ideologies. And by this rubric, anti-Semitism and Zionism could be both called ideologies. But an individual who defines herself or who is defined by others as an anti-Semite or a Zionist does not necessarily structure their entire interpretive universe around one of those isms. That is, you can have an aversion to Jews without perceiving history as an eternal struggle between Jews and Gentiles. Or you can feel an identification with or some kind of attachment to the state of Israel without defining yourself exclusively in terms of Zionism. The word Zionist has often been employed as a pejorative, first in the Stalinist Soviet Union and then throughout the Arab world, and most recently in leftist academic circles throughout the West. Conversely, the word anti-Semite has at times been brandished with pride. So for example, in German-speaking Europe, from the 1890s, or really earlier, 1880s, 
1914, there were anti-Semitic political parties. People called themselves anti-Semites. But most of the time, the word anti-Semitism has been associated with opprobrium to the point that in our own day, it is not uncommon for people to deny they're anti-Semites and then say they hate Jews. That's actually quite common. For this reason, it is far more likely that someone who explicitly calls himself or herself an anti-Semite espouses a sustained, wide-ranging anti-Semitic ideology, rather than someone who calls themselves a Zionist. I mean, lots of people use the word Zionist in a kind of vague, general sense uh, to mean a kind of a, a commitment to the well-being of the state of Israel. It might not mean anything more than that. Ideology can have unconscious sources. It is therefore not sealed off from feeling. We go back to the days of Sigmund Freud and William James, where people have debated about the seat of emotion in the psyche or the body, whether it is culturally constructed or common to all people, whether it is a hallmark of the primitive, which in the Western world was subdued via a civilizing process, or whether it is always present and performed in different ways. Talking about how emotion is performed, however, doesn't get us any closer to defining what emotion is. It's amazing how much of the literature on the history of emotions doesn't say, like, what is emotion? So we've talked about what's ideology. Now, what is emotion? Well, off the bat, we could call it irrational or non-rational cognition and volition. We often justify our emotions, however, in terms of reality and logic. That is, people can base logical argumentation on preposterous assumptions or draw conclusions from biased observations. In other words, an emotion is no more or less rational or concrete than an idea. Also, both emotion and ideology are expressed in language. The difference between the two is that emotion begins with a vague feeling, which is after the fact, maybe milliseconds thereafter, expressed via language, where ideology is encased in language, which then elicits emotional reactions. That is, we only know what we are feeling once it is put into words. For the words we use and the actions we take as a result of those words vary across time and space. So I think if we're gonna talk about what emotion is, let's just get rid of the concept of rationality altogether. And I'd like to follow the political scientist Roger Peterson, who defines emotion as a psychological mechanism that regulates the in intensity and saliency of desire. It's about what do you want in that moment? I would embellish that definition, though. I would like to make a difference, and you're going to see this as I get more, more deeply into the talk, between negative emotions and positive emotions. There are negative emotions such as fear, resentment, hatred, rage, jealousy, what do they all have in common? These, what do we mean by a negative emotion? Expressions of disequilibrium. You're out of kilter. Unfulfilled desire. All of these emotions are about unfulfilled desire, as opposed to positive emotions, such as pride, contentment, or generosity. These are expressions of equilibrium, of having achieved something that you want or, or anticipating it. Now, the most liminal emotion is love because love can indicate both fulfilled and unfulfilled desire. I mean, either it's unrequited love or it's requited. So, so on this view, what is anti-Semitism? It's a verbalization of disequilibrium. You're angry, you're jealous, you're, you're enraged, you're looking for someone to blame, you're unfulfilled. Whereas Zionism is more complicated. It combines aspects of disequilibrium, fear being the most obvious example, and equilibrium, pride, love, anticipation of fulfillment. Both anti-Semites and Zionists are equally based in affect and their, their affective origin, but they draw on different palettes. So now that's the broad overview. Now let me give you some concrete examples um, by first turning to Theodor Herzl and his approach to Zionism, and also to what extent his Zionism was a product of anti-Semitism. Uh, it's a little easier to answer the second question than the first, although my argument is counterintuitive because I actually, and in this biography of Herzl I just finished, I think anti-Semitism does very little to explain Herzl's turn to Zionism. So let me explain that. Now you might think, well, of course, Theodor Herzl became a Zionist because of anti-Semitism. After all, when he was a university student, and then later when he was a state attorney, he endured disturbing anti-Semitic incidents. At the age of 22, he was badly shaken by an anti-Semitic screed by Eugen Döring with the rather ominous title, The Jewish Question as a Racial, Moral, and Cultural Question. It sounds even more ominous in German. 
Herzl did not, however, react in any sustained way to anti-Semitic discourse around him until 1893. And then, rather than adopt a Jewish nationalist stance, he fantasized about Jewish conversion to Catholicism as a way of ending the Jewish problem, or Jewish participation in socialist revolution. So he, he didn't turn to Jewish nationalism just because of anti-Semitism. His growing Jewish self-awareness and self-pride then manifested itself in his play, Das Neue Ghetto, The New Ghetto of 1894, which was written before Alfred Dreyfus's first trial for espionage, which Herzl covered as the Paris correspondent of Central Europe's most prestigious newspaper, the New Free Press. Simultaneously in Vienna, the anti-Semitic city councillor and Christian socialist Karl Lueger was elected mayor, seated in 1897. Now, I don't know why scholars for 100 years or more have said the Dreyfus Affair made Herzl into a Zionist. It is absolutely untrue. Um, Dreyfus doesn't even show up in any of Herzl's writings until November of 1896. Uh, Herzl is clearly directly obsessed about what's happening in Vienna and reacting to other things that I'll talk about in just a moment. In 1895, he gets to the point where he enters a kind of a frenzy that lasts several months. You might call it a manic episode. I've had my book manuscript read by psychiatrists and psychologists who say we can't engage in retrospective <laughs> diagnosis, but it seems to have been a full-blown manic episode, out of which came uh, eventually the pamphlet, The Jewish State. The thing is, here's the problem I have, though, with this whole notion of anti-Semitism makes Herzl into a Zionist. Most Central European Jews were exposed to anti-Semitism in the 1890s. In fact, it was pretty normal. But most of them did not become Zionists. In other words, anti-Semitism was a necessary but not sufficient condition for Herzl becoming a Zionist. The other essential component was much more emotional, which gets back to my emphasis on the affective nature, at least for Herzl, of Zionism, which was that he lived in a state of chronic psychological distress. Throughout his life, Herzl battled depression. And he frequently acknowledged that only success, theatrical, journalistic, political, could bring him out of his funk. Herzl did have some friendships, but in general, it was very difficult for him to establish close relations, especially romantic or erotic ones with others. He had like the world's worst marriage, and he had a very difficult time making friends. Uh, his ability to form lasting loving relationships was stunted by the death during his late teens of his sister Pauline, he never got over that. And a woman named Madeline Hertz, not Herzl, Hertz, who was the daughter of family friends. He had a schoolboy crush on her, and, uh, and she died. As a young man, Herzl had dalliances with women that left him physically disgusted by women and marred by gonorrhea. When he first met his future wife, Julie Nashauer, in 1886, he was very attracted to her physically but he didn't know what to do with the physical attraction. He was overwhelmed by it, and he was um, then, uh, he suffered from nausea and psychosomatic pain. He contemplated suicide. He didn't know what to do with the feelings that she was evoking in him. Shortly after meeting Julie and then being repelled by his attraction to her, he developed an infatuation with the 14-year-old niece of Madeline Hertz, the woman he had fallen in love with m many years previously. So clearly, this is a man who has some issues. <laughs> now, in that same year, we're talking about 1886, Herzl published his first book of feuilleton, that is literary essays, called News from Venus. This is not coincidental. Venus is associated with that which is distant and unattainable, that which is enticing from afar, but loathsome when encountered up close. One of the most revealing stories in the collection is about a man who can read others' thoughts. It goes on at length about the ease with which innocence turns to corruption. Herzl associated Venus, the goddess of erotic love, with a false idol, preferring to dwell instead in the realm of chaste love for a pubescent girl, for example, or his sister Pauline. Because he, he, in his novel Alt Neuland, um, the female character who marries the Herzl character is an avatar of Pauline. So there's, again, some interesting stuff going on. Evidence to substantiate my assertion is Herzl's fascination with Richard Wagner's opera Tannhäuser, he devoted an entire essay to it in May of 1895, listened to it repeatedly while immersed in his frenzy of June of 1895, and he had 20 minutes of selections from Tannhäuser played at the Second Zionist Congress in 1898. Now, what's Tannhäuser about? 
It's the story of a man trapped by Venus in the Mount of Venus, Venusberg, and who seeks to escape her spell for earthly existence and the spiritual love of the beautiful and chaste Elizabeth. Now, I'm not the first scholar to have noted that Herzl liked the opera, but scholars tend to read it politically as an allegory of escape from the ghetto, the grotto of Venus, the ghetto, or the futility of assimilation. I think there's a more obvious answer. Given Herzl's psychological baggage, it makes much more sense to read his engagement with the opera as the search for an escape from Venus, that is, his own stunted and difficult emotional erotic life, Zionism giving him a cause to which he could sacrifice himself completely, driving himself to an early death, just as Tannhäuser in the opera encounters a premature and tragic death, but also redemption. A final piece of evidence on my point is one of Herzl's last short stories was called, yes, The Beloved of Venus. It's about a retired Roman dictator, clearly an alter ego of Herzl, who has given up the responsibility of maintaining the Roman Empire and longs for simple and earthly pleasures. What happens to him? He is killed while making love to his enemy's mistress. For Herzl, being the, love, the beloved of Venus was not a good thing. Now, many of Herzl's feuilletons are coated in a sugary sentimentality that does not fully conceal their bitter emotional core. In one of Herzl's best short stories, Sarah Holtzman, the irretrievable girl woman from Herzl's erotic past, takes the form of a beautiful but sad-faced lass whose brassy and bejeweled mother is having an affair. The story is told by a friend of the family, a tortured and struggling artist whose love for the girl is both avuncular and romantic. So what happens in the story, Sarah Holtzman, is Herzl's placing himself in the position of a narrator, as he did six years later in a, a, a very late story before his death called Die Brille, The Reading Glasses, about a man approaching middle age, and I felt identification with this, with weakening vision. A rather blurred image of a young woman in a hotel salon reminds the narrator of, yes, once again, a 14-year-old girl whom he had loved in his youth. As a political thinker and leader, Herzl had a powerful vision of the Jewish future, but emotionally, he was fixated in the past. And there's no contradiction between the two. A person can have political genius, leadership genius, charisma, but be emotionally quite stunted. These writings, though, do not tell us directly why Herzl become a Zionist. They talk directly, though, to a blocked and suffering emotional self. And that has to do with things far beyond uh, anti-Semitism. Now, the emotional pain does not in and of itself explain why he became a Zionist. You have to combine the two. There are other emotions also that we have to look at. For example, Herzl was proud. And pride kept him from endorsing conversion. He thought about it. Maybe the Jews should all convert to Christianity and anti-Semitism would go away. But he was too proud for that. The other emotion that dictated his life was fear. He was a bourgeois Jew who was afraid of socialist revolution. He was afraid of anarchy. And so he could not endorse a left-wing solution to the problems of Europe and the problems of the Jews. So pride kept him from becoming a convert. Fear keeps him from advocating socialism. He's emotionally something of a wreck. He could have had a complete breakdown. That's my reading of Herzl. But his, his Zionism kept it at bay. It gave him a sense of purpose until the frailties of his body, he had a congenital heart defect, uh, killed him at the age of 44. Herzl's Zionism was linked to an overpowering sense of shame. We've talked about pride, fear. Now I'm going to talk about shame that had haunted Herzl from his youth. As a student, he castigated himself for avoiding fighting a duel or for failing to keep his passions sufficiently under control. Herzl uh, dis expressed disgust with other Jews whom he found ugly and vulgar. I mean, Herzl writes things in his diaries that are really quite disturbing about other Jews. Now, we could use the term Jewish self-hatred to describe this. Some scholars use this term, but I don't think it does very much to explain why some Jews in Central Europe in the late 19th century were so much more vulnerable than others to a kind of storm of revulsion over alleged flaws in the Jewish character. It's interesting that expressions of shame or its opposite honor rarely appear in Herzl's writings for a non-Jewish audience, but they are central to his Zionist writings. 
particularly his novel, Old New Land. I think it's only in writings intended for a Jewish audience when Herzl could openly confront his feelings, which were no less part of his psyche than the melancholy and yearning of his journalistic writings. His, he was a very, very good journalistic writer in the Viennese press, and his stories were often kind of sepia-tinted, melancholy, world-weary. There was a kind of tone that was extremely popular. He was assuming a role there. Now, Herzl's stories are filled with heroic men, possessed of nobility and what Herzl himself frequently referred to as icy calm. What's going on here is a projection of his own self-fashioning. Herzl was psychologically exoskeletal, with a surface as hard and brilliant as his prose. In his pamphlet, The Jewish State, Herzl presented himself as a supremely rational human being who has not embraced Zionism as a passion, but simply discovered it as a fact of nature. This is what I mean. He's, he's, he's not presenting himself in an emotional way. He's saying, I'm a calm, rational human being. I've discovered this thing called anti-Semitism. He, 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 he understands it coolly in a kind of detached diagnosis. And then he offers a cure for what he calls a deadly and ineradicable hatred of Jews. Herzl claims that he approaches Zionism without fear or hatred, without emotion, no, no, no disequilibrium, no psychological turbulence. He sees in anti-Semitism elements of, and I'm quoting Herzl, purported self-defense. He says, look, emancipated Jews are good at what they do. Right? They're, they're economically active in commerce and the professions, and Gentiles are afraid of Jews. So he's, he's trying to offer this kind of rational explanation of anti-Semitism. And he writes, it will behoove anti-Semites to get rid of the Jews. And for this reason, Herzl writes in The Jewish State, which, by the way, is the true definition of a classic. It's a book that everybody refers to and very few people read. <laughs> it's only 20,000 words, but how many people have actually read? You read the whole thing word for word, 80% of it is very technical. And what he writes is, quote, honest anti-Semites, this is Herzl, honest anti-Semites will combine with our officials in controlling the transfer of our properties. Anti-Semites will even buy shares in the economic arm of the Zionist enterprise, known as the Jewish company. And Zionists will repay their kindness, and I'm quoting Herzl, by giving every assistance to governments and parliaments in their efforts to direct the inner migrations of Christian citizens to formerly Jewish properties. The only emotion that Herzl expresses in these very clinical passages, most of the Jewish state is written in a cold, surgical, clinical tone. The only emotion is pride and a yearning for honor. Herzl Weitz writes, every obligation in the old country must be scrupulously fulfilled before leaving. Any private claim will be heard more readily in the Jewish state than anywhere else. We shall never wait for reciprocity. We shall act entirely in accord with our honor. In one of the pamphlet's most famous passages, Herzl writes that we, the Jews, will protect the holy sites of Jerusalem by assigning to them an extraterritorial status, as is well known to the law of nations. We shall form, and listen to this, a guard of honor about these sanctuaries answering for the fulfillment of this duty with our very existence. What's the purpose of the Jewish state? The purpose of the Jewish state is to win the respect and honor of the Gentiles. There's a reservoir underneath that cold and clinical language of urgency and sympathy. It is this combination of superficial sang-froid and underlying despair that makes the pamphlet so rhetorically effective. So when you read the pamphlet, Think about how it was intended to affect an audience in Central Europe, Eastern Europe, in the late 1890s. And I just want to read you briefly of the example, an example, the effect that reading the Jewish state had on Herzl's closest ally, Max Nordau, a great literature, uh, literary figure himself. This is what Nordau writes in a letter written in extremely hasty, uh, emotionally kind of uh, fraught handwriting. Nordau writes to Herzl, highly heroic, is this brave, more than brave, indeed utterly fearless in German Todeskühne, recognition of the ultimate feeling which all Jews until now have had in the deepest recesses of their soul. You must be able to empathize with me, sie müssen es mir nachfühlen können, that I do this, that I react with such force. You can see the effect it has on 
Nordau. And by the way, this letter that Nordau writes to Herzl, like five years later, Nordau writes to Herzl again, I don't know if you remember the letter I sent you when I first read The Jewish State, but you know, he doubled down on how meaningful it was to him. This really mattered. So this is just one example. Herzl was aware of the emotional effect he had on his followers. He knew that the success of Zionism depended upon the emotional energy of which he had become the center. His carefully cultivated appearance, his stage management of the Zionist Congresses, these were performative acts to attract masses to the movement. Herzl himself would consistently cultivate coolness, even if he was boiling inside. And boil he did. With wounded pride when shunted aside by the German emperor or Ottoman sultan, irritation and pique when confronted by obstreperous Russian Zionists on any number of issues, and most notoriously disgust with Jewish assimilationists as he wrote in a notorious essay from 1897 in which he explicitly used anti-Semitic language to describe his Jewish opponents as dishonest and dishonorable. So Herzl Zionism was rooted in emotional distress but expressed via a pseudo-technocratic language that connoted control over the passion. His persona combined passion and empathy with discipline and strength. The compassion was embodied in his dark, deep-set eyes, which appeared to witness the tragic fate of the Jewish people. And his dignity was embodied in his beard, his full, dark beard, which gave him the look of an ancient Near Eastern monarch. Herzl elicited awe from, and he instilled pride into his supporters. By elevating anti-Semitism into a rational ideology, he hoped to defeat it by spiriting away the irritant that lay at its core. You anti-Semites, it's totally logical that you hate the Jews. We'll take care of the problem. We'll move the Jews elsewhere, and the Jews who remain in the world will be respected because of the new Jewish state. What could be more obvious, Herzl wrote. Okay, he didn't quite get it right, but you understand the logic that is underneath his uh, thinking. Now, how did anti-Semites react to Herzl's work? Well, actually, some anti-Semites liked it. The Hungarian politician and journalist Ivan von Simony uh, and the notorious French journalist Edouard Drummond responded enthusiastically to the first Zionist Congress of 1897. And for more than a decade, Drummond championed Zionism because, as he wrote, it would get the Jews out of Europe but he also believed it was honest. It was honest because the Jews were admitting that they're different, that they are a nationality. And this gave him uh, a certain measure of trust and respect for Zionism. But by 1913, Drummond had given up on Zionism because it had given up on Herzl's grand goal of spiriting millions of Jews away from Europe and off to a distant land. Drummond then fell into classic anti-Semitic stereotypes blaming the limitations of Zionism on Jewish plutocrats like the Rothschilds or Maurice de Hirsch. Since anti-Semitism is at heart an emotional manifestation reflecting ongoing social and economic disequilibrium, Herzl's attempts <clears throat> to elevate it into a rational ideology were doomed to fail. That's the point. He tried to make it into an ideology and it failed. Herzl encountered anti-Semitism wherever he went in his diplomatic activity, particularly with the German and Russian governments. The Chancellor and Foreign Secretary of Germany were cold to him. Kaiser Wilhelm II was wont to refer to Jews as kikes, killers of Christ, and socialist revolutionaries. The Russian interior minister, Vyacheslav Pleva, was even more scornful. British officials were less overtly anti-Semitic, and Herzl was able to win trust from the colonial and foreign secretaries to obtain an offer of territory in British East Africa. Now, his diplomatic failures, though, can't be attributed to anti-Semitism alone. Rather, a simple fact of international relations. In international relations, actors get what they want through threatening and bargaining. Herzl had nothing to threaten with. Right? What, what's he going to do? He had nothing to threaten with, and he had little to offer. His only bargaining chip was Jewish financial support to restructure the Ottoman debt. But A, he didn't have the money, and B, it was not enough to gain the emperor's support. So now there is a third mechanism besides threatening and bargaining by which an international actor can try to get what they want, and that would be what the uh, scholar Todd Hall 
calls emotional diplomacy. That is, international actors signal their intentions to each other through displays of official emotion, which may or may not be genuine. It's not that, you know, if I'm the president of France and I make an emotional statement on behalf of the state of Israel or some other country, it's not necessarily important what I personally feel. It's that I'm indicating a change in foreign policy. I'm willing to stake my public uh, uh, presence on it. Herzl, unfortunately, never mastered emotional diplomacy. When he appealed to the great powers, he did so in the name of self-interest. It will be good for you, he would say to the English or the French or the Germans or the Turks. It'll be good for you, right? He's trying to be rational. He's not appealing to the emotions. Unfortunately, though, um, it wasn't in their interest to support Zionism in 1896 or 1900 or 1904. And here we now see the genius of Heim Weizmann because Heim Weizmann was able to succeed in a way that Herzl failed. Isaiah Berlin once remarked, like many visionaries, Herzl understood issues, but not human beings. Herzl, according to Isaiah Berlin, did not understand the Eastern European Jewish masses. Chaim Weizmann was different. He grasped their needs. He articulated their views. Now, I admit, there is a rather romanticized and simplified image of Weizmann. I don't want to add to literature on Weizmann that presents him, as he's usually depicted, as an earthy folk Jew, the man from Pinsk, whose soulful glance and sparkling wit encapsulated the spirit of the shtetl. Not entirely true. Weizmann was no less than Herzl, a flawed man. He was vain and insecure. He was prone to hypochondriasis. He was an absent father. And unlike Herzl, he was a womanizer. Herzl did understand human beings, actually, but only their externalities. He was a journalist. He could walk into a room and he could make a sketch and he would depict everyone in this room exactly as you look and exactly your body language and all of that. But he wouldn't be able to get inside any of your <coughs> minds. Weizmann was different. Weizmann had empathy. He had EQ, emotional, high, high emotional intelligence. He was sensitive in both meanings of the term. He was easily hurt, but he would also be bound up with whoever he was speaking with. Herzl seized on Zionism as a drowning man grasps a life preserver, but Weizmann had been a confident and unreflective Zionist from childhood onward. He was a product of a traditional Eastern European society. He had no qualms about thinking about the Jews as a nation. It was merely a matter of what solution to the Jewish question he would adopt. Two of his 12 siblings chose Bundism and communism with tragic results. As one scholar has written, as a student in Germany, Weizmann's naive love of Zionism became somewhat more analytical or sophisticated, but he never was an original thinker. You know, when you read books about Zionist thought, Herzl, Achada Am, Buber, Chaim Weizmann never appears. He wasn't a thinker. He was a politician. He was a doer. He was a leader. Weizmann, like Herzl, possessed qualities of two kinds of leadership that the Leadership Studies School uh, uh, writes about. You know, there's transformational leadership, the ability to transform the world, and there's transactional leadership, the ability to make a deal. Well, <clears throat> I'll avoid that term. <laughs> the ability to, um, to, to be a, an, an effective administrator. Herzl had both kinds of leadership skills. Uh, Weizmann had them too, but Herzl was tormented. And as a result, he could never connect to other human beings. Weizmann was merely troubled. That is, he was a normal neurotic human being. And he did have this tremendous power of empathy. And he communicated not by direct reference to raison d'etat, as Herzl did, but by emotional signaling. So when Weizmann talks with the British government about the negotiations leading up to the Balfour Declaration, what does he talk about? The historical wrongs committed against the Jews, which then evoke pity and compassion. He talks about the Jews deserving admiration and respect. He encounters complicated mixtures of anti-Semitism and philo-Semitism. Arthur James Balfour, who issued the Balfour Declaration, first meets Zionism, in oh, not first, but he meets with Weizmann in December of 1914. And what does Weizmann do? He doesn't talk about why it would be in Britain's interests to support Zionism. Rather, Weizmann offers a threnody about the Jews' legacy of suffering. And I'm quoting from Weizmann's letter to Achada Am. On hearing my words, Balfour was moved to tears. Quote, he took me by the hand 
and said, I had illuminated for him the road followed by a great suffering nation. Now, I don't know what Balfour was really feeling. I mean, it's really complicated. He was making an emotional signal. And Weizmann is clearly touching something here. I mean, Balfour himself was also writing, as he wrote to Lucien Wolfe, you Jews are exceedingly clever people who in spite of your oppression have achieved a certain success which excites the jealousy and envy of peoples among whom you live. So it's not like Balfour became, you know, entirely besotted with Jews. But Weizmann was able to exploit myths of Jewish financial power. Herzl actually believed that Jews had the financial ability to solve the Ottoman Empire's, you know, massive debt. Weizmann knew better. Weizmann knew that he was, as he called himself, a king of the schnorrers. But he used the British belief in that kind of power. But mostly he was appealing to, um, or at least largely, he was appealing to sympathy. Now, scholars have written to the, I mean, hundreds of books about the Balfour Declaration. And what I really want to stress here is it's not just about the interests of the British state, although they were important. There was a diplomacy of sympathy as well. He was engaging in bargaining and threatening, as I mentioned earlier, as state and state-seeking actors often behave in the international arena. So then you ask, what was the added value of his emotional appeal, of moving Balfour to tears, of talking about the suffering of the Jews? What did it add? In emotional diplomacy, actors believe that their expressions of feeling will be welcomed by the person they're speaking with. In order to succeed, the signals must appear sincere and indicate a willingness to make significant commitments or sacrifices. And sure enough, think about the Balfour Declaration. It is a vast commitment. It's only, what, 60 words or something? But it's a vast commitment in return for which Weizmann and his Zionist partners are called upon to be of service. Dismissing the emotional component of these negotiations does nothing to explain why that component existed in the first place. Why didn't the British and the Zionists simply speak in terms of naked interest, of quid pro quo? The emotional signals and the tangible consequences of those signals are ways of indicating sincerity, which foster agreement between states or state-seeking actors, addressing thereby the fundamental problem that lies at the core of international relations, the inability to fathom another actor's interests or intentions for good or ill. So I've spoken then of the emotional signals that Weizmann and the British elite sent to each other. The emotional impact of the Balfour Declaration was also vast upon the Jewish world. And um, I have a chapter in my book on gratitude. The Jewish press in the United Kingdom, Australia, Canada, especially Canada, but also the United States, was overwhelmed by the language of gratitude, gr gratitude to Britain. Now, gratitude assumes a certain dependence. You're grateful to people who do something for you. You might not be able to perform at the same level for them. And you see this when Chaim Weizmann routinely referred to the Balfour Declaration as the Jewish Magna Carta. And what was the Magna Carta? It was imposed by a sovereign. Yes, imposed upon rebellious and angry barons, but it was very much an act of grace. And if that isn't enough, Weizmann also compared the Balfour Declaration to the Edict of Cyrus that allowed Jews to return from their Babylonian captivity to the land of Israel in, in, in antiquity. So this language of gratitude, of dependence, uh, and you see this in the Jewish press, 1918, 1919 in the United States, anticipation that Jewish statehood is imminent, uh, really a feeling of, again, a positive emotion of anticipation of the fulfillment of long-standing um, emotional needs. For many Jews, the most powerful emotional consequence of the Declaration was the setting aside of fear. The massive suffering they had endured during and especially after the war in the bloodlands of Eastern Europe between the Baltic and Black Seas would be redeemed by the Jewish national home. Now, more than 30 years separated the issuing of the Balfour Declaration from the establishment of the State of Israel. Did the Declaration staunch anti-Semitism? No, quite the opposite. It intensified it. Unlike Herzl, whose diplomatic accomplishments were meager and attracted only sidelong glances from anti-Semites, Weizmann made the Jewish claim for Palestine something recognized by the world's mightiest empire. Anti-Semites were alarmed. 
The Declaration elicited all the emotions that lie at the core of modern anti-Semitism. Resentment over status inequity, hatred due to perceived wrongs, and despair engendered by a sense of powerlessness. In France, there was a great deal of resentment against British imperialism. In Germany, which was crushed by the World War, saw its territory reduced, Zionists received quite a bit of negative attention as we learned from the important work of uh, Francis Nicosia, that the Nazi ideologue Alfred Rosenberg wrote in the early 1920s that the World War had been initiated by the Jews in order to obtain a state in Palestine. And since, according to Rosenberg, Jews are incapable of doing anything creative or administrative, what they called a state would actually be a power base for global and nefarious business operations. On this view, there was no Anglo-Zionist conspiracy in World War I. No, the Jews enlisted the British as willing dupes. For a defeated people, the anti-Semitic trope of Jewish omnipotence was a discursive correlate to a feeling of German powerlessness. So for anti-Semites after World War I, Zionism is something deeply, deeply powerful and effective, becomes overwhelming, and ideology. The most sustained anti-Semitic treatment of the Balfour Declaration, though, did not come from defeated Germany, but from the victorious United States. And its author is probably unknown to most people in the room. If I'm wrong, and some of you know of William Cameron, an unprepossessing, rather nondescript, dipsomaniac journalist from Hamilton, Ontario, a graduate of the University of Toronto, I'm sorry to say. He would never have been known to history had it not been for the fact that in 1918 he left his job as a city reporter for the Detroit News to write for Henry Ford, whom he served between 1921 and 1927 as editor of Ford's newspaper, the Dearborn Independent. He worked at the paper until 1946. Cameron was Ford's spokesperson and media handler. He was an adherent and until the early 1940s, a leader of the British Israelite movement, which avowed that the 10 lost tribes of Israel were the ancestors of the Anglo-Saxons and that the Jews were descended from Judah, a mongrel Asiatic race. So he was a real dyed-in-the-wool anti-Semite. Cameron wrote all or most of the articles in the Dearborn Independent that were collected into a book in the early 1920s called The International Jew. Now, the Ford Oral History Project in 1952 interviewed Cameron. And he claimed to have been disgusted by his assignment to write anti-Semitic uh, uh, pieces. In fact, he wrote them with great uh, gusto. At least three times in the 1920s, Cameron met with the Nazi agent Kurt Ludica, who had been sent to the United States to mobilize support. There was no daylight between Cameron and Ford, with whom he lunched every day with Ford's son, Edsel, in the Ford factory private dining room. When you read the Independent, the Dearborn Independent, the Balfour Declaration is very much central to a carefully wrought anti-Semitic worldview. Quote, when the British army passed into Jerusalem in 1917, the protocols of the elders of Zion went with it. There are three elements of danger in the situation as it exists today. The predominance of Bolshevism that is being poured into Palestine the intense egotism that Zionists exert even before they get a potato patch, the taste for world politics and world power, and the racial confusion that now exists in Palestine. Cameron claimed that Zionism served the interests of both Jewish capital and Jewish Bol Bolshevism. The government of Palestine, he quote, was Jewish, headed by the Zionist Sir Herbert Samuel and Vladimir Jabotinsky, whom Cameron called a Bolshevik. That's really quite a stretch for people who know something about Jabotinsky. He displays sympathy for Palestine's Arabs who are being purloined, and he claims that the Declaration's clause about protecting the civil and religious rights of natives was simply meant to appease Jewish non-Zionists. So this is a carefully you know, uh, constructed, we're talking about dozens and dozens of articles that he writes, in which the Balfour Declaration and Zionism feature quite, um, quite strongly. He also claimed that uh, Herzl and Nordau were architects of the First World War, 
because they claimed that there would be a world war someday. So therefore, they were the architects of the First World War, out of which would come the collapse of the Ottoman Empire and the rise of a Jewish state. Now, was this idiosyncratic? And as I finish, I want to make a reference to something more recent about this link between criticism of Jewish wartime politics and anti-Semitic ideology. In 1985, a British lawyer named Robert John and Sami Hadawi, director of the Institute for Palestine Studies in Beirut, published a lengthy critique of the Balfour Declaration in the Journal of Historical Review, a pseudo-scholarly publication devoted to Holocaust denial. And in the article, John and Hadawi claim that World War I by 1916 was approaching uh, exhaustion and that there would have been a uh, non-punitive armistice had it not been for the Jews. That Jews in the United States pushed the uh, country into the war for reasons that had nothing to do with unrestricted submarine warfare or the Zimmerman telegram. It was just a Jewish desire to push the U.S. into the war so that there would be a Jewish state. And this all, according to this article, uh, accounts for Louis Brandeis's appointment to the U.S. Supreme Court, claiming that Wilson only appointed Brandeis to the court because um, uh, Brandeis had private letters implicating Wilson with uh, adultery. So basically, it was extortion that got Brandeis onto the court, and then Brandeis became the leader of Zion. It all makes sense, you see. So, I mean, I mean but this is a very elaborate kind of argument. Um, now, of course, Brandeis and Weizmann should not be blamed for these anti-Semitic conspiracy theories, whether they're by John and Hadawi or by Cameron decades previously. You can criticize the Balfour Declaration, and there are people who I think with quite a bit of justice criticize it as a calculated imperialistic strategy or bemoan its failure to consider the political aspiration of the Palestinians. But there is a vast difference between a reasoned, even if harsh, critique of British and Zionist politics and the unvarnished anti-Semitism of the sources I've been talking about. We see in the 1985 article or in Cameron's work claims emanating from fear, animosity towards Jews. And I don't think that John and Hadawi did the Palestinian cause any good by publishing an overtly anti-Semitic article in a journal that espouses Holocaust denial. Doing so makes it all too easy to link the real sufferings endured by the Palestinians with the imaginary complaints of anti-Semites. It's not surprising, although disheartening, that supporters of the Palestinians sometimes do repeat old anti-Semitic canards. What's more interesting and more relevant as I conclude today is the extent to which oppressed peoples, including Palestinians, and the extent to which anti-Semites share a common emotional vocabulary, those negative feelings of fear, resentment, hatred, and anger. And for oppressed people, shame and frustration carry a particularly high level of significance because these feelings arise when one deals with a bona fide act of victimization and is unable to avenge it or to seek redress. Although anti-Zionist and anti-Semitic discourse are often compared, let's not forget that Zionist and anti-Semitic discourses then can also be tied together. As I said at the outset, Zionism and anti-Semitism, varieties of nationalism and racism respectively, share a swath of negative emotions. Like other forms of racism though, anti-Semitism is virtually free from positive emotions. How many anti-Semites employ their argument as expressions of love or pride or joy. I mean, Nazi anti-Semitism has language of pride and joy about the German nation. The anti-Semitism itself, though, is strongly negative. All nationalisms can be cruel and exclusionary. Zionism's no exception. But nationalisms can be inspirational and inculcate into humanity a yearning for achievement and solidarity. Perhaps it is wrong for people to love their countries, but love them they often do. Whether that love is naive, as it was for Weizmann, or sentimental, as it was for Herzl, Zionism has constructed an affective matrix, a national home that has sustained millions of Jews, psychically and physically. Anti-Semitism, too, appears to provide people with a sense of emotional satisfaction in that it accounts for their personal or collective failures and limitations. But its therapeutic powers are feeble, 
unless it is stoked to a frenzy. And when that occurs, the consequences are disastrous. Thank you. So, yeah, 45 minutes. So uh, we've got plenty of time for questions and comments. We can open up to questions now. Yeah, yeah, please. Yeah. I have terrible vision, so you'll need to sort of wave your hand a little bit. But, or should, should I call on people, or do you want to call on people? Or? Yeah, my score, my schema. Yeah. Um, again, I'm a big fan of, the, so it really has to do with the question of myth and what role myth would play in this schema of looking at a form of nationalism on the one hand and a form of racism on the other. And a lot of the answer would depend on how we define myth. And I don't want to go all Jordan Peterson here, my former University of Toronto colleague. Um, but you know, if we define myth as a kind of a a narrative that helps give people a sense of meaning to their lives, a kind of meta-narrative, a narrative about the collective, a narrative about the origins of the world, a narrative about the nature of, 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 of evil, these sort of, you know, these supramundane stories of factors or, or yeah, factors far ab beyond, above and beyond our direct power over our lives. Well, myths can be based in reality, right? So, I mean, a lot of the myths let's say that uh, Zionism, you know, the Zionist educational system creates in the interwar period, some of those myths are based in truth. Some of them are fabrications. So, you know, the term myth then has that kind of scholarly meaning as opposed to the notion of a fabrication, a hoax, you know, the myth of Jewish power, that kind of thing. So it could be then that the concept of myth and nationalism veers more towards the more complex combination of reality and uh, embroidery. However, even anti-Semitic myths do have an element of reality. Racist myths do not flourish if they have absolutely nothing whatsoever to do with the world. I mean, um, I forget, am I being recorded because I'm going to say something that can't be broadcast? I can't, okay, because this trial is still, no, the trial is still, oh well. Um, I can tell you about it later, about a trial that just completed that I was involved in, because uh, I just read the judgment. Anyway, um, uh, you know, if, if uh, let's say there's this conversation about Rothschild, you know, and Jewish economic power. Well, of course the Rothschilds don't have the economic power that anti-Semites say they do, but there is this, you know, Jewish banking dynasty, the Rothschilds. And, um, you know, there are a lot of Jews on Wall Street. I mean, there are. Doesn't, Jews don't control Wall Street. They don't control American <laughs> capitalism. So you take that little, I, I think there's a difference between that kernel of reality and the notion of a kind of a explanatory myth behind nationalism, the myth of origins, the myth of Jewish solidarity throughout the centuries across all times and places, the myth of the connection to Zion, right? So I, I see it more as a spectrum though and less as a categorical distinction. I'm not sure if that, I would say that the, the way I was thinking was in the sort of the David Nuremberg direction, mm -hmm. that there is this very fundamental and very deep-seated within Christendom, within yeah. the Christian world, that gets expressed uh, over and over mm -hmm. in different forms, but in fact the, the origins of it are not in, in what we would call reality. Yes, and I, I know, because he's talking about an intra-Christian. This is David Nuremberg, wrote a brilliant book on anti-Judaism. And it's a brilliantly executed book with a very powerful argument about a kind of an intra-Christian. You use the, the Jew with a small j, as it were, to illustrate whatever it is you don't like about other Christian groups. 
So for example, if or you, yourself. sorry? Or yourself. Or yourself, so you project it outwards. The problem I have with that argument, it, it might work for much of antiquity, or you know, I, leave, I leave the medieval and pre-modern world to your expertise. But I can tell you that in the 19th and 20th century, for example, to talk about Jews and the radical left, well, of course there would have been a radical left without Jews. And of course you can't equate Bolshevism with the Jews. The fact is a lot of Jews were attracted to radical causes. I mean, there is, there is something to it. It doesn't explain the fundamental anger and hatred, but there is that element of reality that it, that it clings to. So I'm not sure if that, I'm not, you notice that his book really doesn't deal with the late modern period very well. He doesn't deal with the 20th century terribly well. So, in a, so that might make, make us think about the extent to which late modern anti-Semitism has at least tried to anchor itself in some glimmer of reality. Uh, did you look or try to look at all at um, the two factors, uh, Zionism and Antisemitism, um, isolated from each other? Would, you know, uh, as unlikely as that uh, ever occurred, but what would Zionism be without the et cetera, et cetera? Mm -hmm. um, I mean, is that even possible to think out? Or? That's great. Uh, that's a really good question. Well, I love thought experiments, and unlike some historians, I love counterfactual history because my argument is that all historical writing is counterfactual, even though we don't know it, because we're always writing about causation, which means we're ruling out other forms of causation. So we're saying if X, then Y, we're assuming if not X, then, then not Y. And legal reasoning is counterfactual. And there's a great book I'd like to plug called What Ifs of Jewish History? which is a counterfactual history of the Jews. And I think 15 of us have essays in it. Uh, so anyway, Zionism without anti-Semitism. Well, there are many reasons why Jews become Jewish nationalists in the 19th century. I honestly think that anti-Semitism is a very important one, but I don't, it's certainly not the only one. I mean, the first chapter of my new book, which is about love, it's called What's Love Got to Do With, What's Love Got to Do With It? The Emotional Language of Early Zionism. What I'm finding is an expression of sentimental love of the Jewish people and of the land of Israel, which is really just so in keeping with the nationalism of Polish, well, not so much Ukrainian, Czech, Polish, German, especially, nationalism of the period. Um, it'd be really kind of hard to imagine Jews not developing some form of particularistic nationalism. Now, would it have taken the specific contours of Zionism? Would it have been as desperate? Would it have involved a kind of demographic you know, uh, scheme to get Jews out of uh, Europe and to the promised land? Maybe not. But I think some form of Jewish nationalism does develop for reasons above and beyond anti-Semitism. And as I used to have these arguments many years ago with colleagues. Uh, you know, to equate Zionism with anti-Semitism, I think, does Zionism a bit of a, a, bit of a disservice. Anti-Semitism without Zionism, well, you know, we were just talking about this. People have hated Jews for a long time. And they've hated Jews for many reasons. And anti-Semitism was very well developed in the 19th century. And as I argued, Zionism itself originally didn't have much of an effect on the anti-Semites. They thought, oh, yeah, not bad, you know, if they can pull it off. But it wasn't that big a deal. It was only when Zionism, it was only really the um, revolution, the geopolitical revolution after World War I, in which now Palestine appears to have been committed to the Jewish people for the development of their national home. Now the anti-Semites notice it and they get upset. And you have this alliance between anti-Semites and so much of the Muslim and Arab world and later the developing world that sees in Zionism an extension of Western imperialism. So I think it is hard to imagine 20th century anti-Semitism without Zionism, but of course anti-Semitism was well developed and well in place uh, beforehand. But I'm all in favor of separations, imagining different, few, you know, different, uh, different outcomes, so all of you students in the room, it's okay to be counterfactual, <laughs> as long as your professors say it's okay. Yeah, <clears throat> I wanted to follow up on that because um, the, um, the, the notion, it, it seems more plausible to me that the, the main impetus behind Zionism that almost uh, Pre, pre, that was there 
was a notion of peoplehood mm -hmm. uh, and of, of folk, for lack of a better term. Mm -hmm. uh, <clears throat> and um, you know, some of the thing that, that was was interesting in your talk was that this this notion of a folk that was coming out of Eastern Europe and everything uh, that was not as prosperous as um, middle class Jewry in, in a place like Austria um, that didn't really have a sense, the same kind of sense of a folk, I don't think. It was something tied to the land, to a shtetl, to a, a mm -hmm. sense of peoplehood. It was much better at negotiating an outcome Mm -hmm. uh, with imperial powers because it was more humble. Uh, and uh, it, that seems to be, um, I mean, we have that in this country, even though we, we may not want to return to the original land, there's still yeah. a sense of, uh, even in a secular society, a sense of peoplehood, a sense of a folk, of that we're, we're bound together. Um, and I think that that is, uh, and that, provides an emotionally full existence if you have that. It's very, I wouldn't term it as medication. Mm -hmm. It's just you feel complete if you mm -hmm. are in that milieu. So isn't that what, isn't that a more powerful driver mm -hmm. of, of um, Zionism than anti-Semitism? I mean, anti-Semitism right. is there, right? but our peoplehood I it's see. Really, there. I, it's a very good point. Peoplehood is a really interesting word, because if you do an engram, a Google engram, the word peoplehood only begins to enter public conversation in the United States in the interwar period. People don't even use the word. Um, certainly not in reference to the Jews. And I can refer you to a really interesting book called Peoplehood, <laughs> by Noam Pianko, about uh, you know, Jews use all kinds of words to describe themselves. And uh, these terms that I'm looking at from the 1850s, 1860s, they use words like um, a community of fate, uh, Schicksalgemeinschaft in German, or Kehilat Yehud in Hebrew, which Ernest Renan would later in his famous essay, What is a Nation, called the Communité du Destin. But actually, the Jews had him beat by 30 years. They were using the same language. Not a people in maybe the sense of the word that American Jews would use today, but a sense of some kind of historical stickiness common experience, it's not the same thing as nationhood. And then in the 1860s and 70s, you get some Jewish, not just intellectuals, but also activists in England and Germany. They're not using the word peoplehood, um, but they're talking about a spiritual nation. Uh, we're not a nation like other nations, and there's no talk about an immediate return to Zion, but there is this notion that we're spiritually bound with each other, and someday, Heinrich Gretz, the great Jewish historian of the 1850s, 60s, 70s, writes about this. You know, he writes about the return to Zion in the Messianic era, but there's a kind of sense of, yeah, peoplehood, although he's not using that exact word, spiritual nation or something. Um, so there's all of these ways of talking about the Jews. There's another word that gets used in the later 1800s in Germany, Volkskörper, which means like a people's body or something. I mean, it's a strange term. What Zionism does is argue something a little different that the Jews are not just united by peoplehood or a common sense of history, they are a nation, they have a common need, the physical need, let's say, to construct the Jewish national home in Palestine, they should have a common language, the revived Hebrew language, an economy, and so forth. So what Zionism does is it kind of concretizes these ideas that are already there. But these older, and we've got the great expert in the room, and Tatiana's own work on how Zionism, even in the like, interwar period, how Zionism can still be very much, and I don't mean to ventriloquize you, so if I get it wrong, you know, I don't want to pensplain. <laughs> so, you know, Zionism, it's, it doesn't necessarily mean that we're all going to pack up and go to Palestine, but it's this sense of, yeah, belonging to kind of an ethnic community. So then the question is, what's the role of anti-Semitism in all of this? I agree with you. There's that sense of belonging, of collectivity, and so forth. I think anti-Semitism is... Um, and this came up earlier in conversation today, it's the exogenous shock that transforms the system. That is, you have to have some kind of exogenous force that moves these kind of vague, warm, fuzzy feelings of peoplehood into a program for action.
And that's where the pogroms of the 1880s, and then even worse, the pogroms of 1903 to 1906, and even more so the post-World War I violence in Eastern Europe, each one revolutionizes the Zionist movement one step further. So I, I think they're both necessary, but I absolutely agree with you that there is this kind of um, underlying sense of collectivity. Right. Um, if that is in a sense of fear of loss of the sense of peoplehood, mm -hmm. um, a, a reaction to that is a, a shock, a different kind of shock, the kind of shock that we associate with those very few Zionists who appear in the present. Well, the fear of assimilation is widespread. And again, I'm working on these very early figures. I wouldn't even call them Zionists. I call them kind of uh, uh, Jewish nationalists like Gretz, uh, Hess. These are people who were obsessed with assimilation. Um, again, Roman Jerusalem is one of these books that is sold, you know, I mean, it's a weird book. It's just like he, I don't know, he just wrote, sort of, he did everything that you're not supposed to do as a student. I think he wrote it in one draft and sent it in. It's filled with diatribes against assimilation. And uh, Herzl considers assimilation dishonorable. Nachum Sokolov, who was a great uh, leader of the Zionist movement, wrote an important history of Zionism, wrote a history of Chobov Zion, the lovers of Zion. His enemy in the book is assimilation. So you're right, there's this fear. But there are lots of Jews who are not Zionists in the late 1800s, who are in the early 1900s, who are very worried about assimilation. So not, Zionism is one response to assimilation. You've got kind of mainstream liberal German Jews in the late 19th century. I mean, they don't want Jews to assimilate. They want them to be Torah true and, you know, good German citizens. So Zionism is one response. But I agree with you. Yeah, the fear of assimilation is quite strong. And it's not limited, by the way, to Western Europe. Uh, what is it in... There were parts of Galicia in the 1897 census you'd know better than me, where large swaths of Jews were totally Polonized mm -hmm. in the cities. They're speaking Polish. My grandfather listed Russian as his native language in the 1930 census, not Yiddish. Well, that's a good example. But he was from Belarus. Yes. Uh, I know that George Orwell wrote an essay where he was talking about forms of nationalism. Mm -hmm. He talks about Zionism and anti-Semitism as two examples. Mm -hmm. I was wondering if that had any influence on your work at all and whether or not you thought the identification of anti-Semitism as a form of nationalism has any merit. I don't know the Orwell. Which or Orwell essay is this? It's um, Notes on Nationalism, I believe. Cool. I'll look at it. I love Orwell. That's great. I don't always agree with him, but... Um, and the other question was whether anti-Semitism can be seen as a form of nationalism. I think anti-Semitism can be used in the service of nationalism. Uh, I don't think it's necessary, but it often appears. I mean, I look at Russian nationalism or German nationalism in the 20th century. Uh, some nationalisms don't seem to invoke it very often. That is, American nationalism, you know, anti-Semitism historically, it certainly has been lots of anti-Semitism in this country, but it hasn't been as in, embedded in nationalist ideology as it is in some other countries. Um, and I think a lot of it has to do with the ongoing not just the ongoing role of religion, because after all, American nationalism can be very religious, but the way that religious tradition is dealt with Jews. So, for example, in the United Kingdom, there's a long tradition of barely putting up with other people. They're very good at tolerating people in the United Kingdom. It doesn't mean they like them. They tolerate them. I found that out living there for five years. They're very good at putting up with you. And so, of course, there's anti-Semitism in the United Kingdom, a kind of snobbery. But it is not a fundamental component of... British, English, whatever kinds of forms of national identity you want to you want to talk about. Whereas in Germany, there were these very deep-seated feelings of anti-Semitism. This gets back to your world, you know, reaching back many hundreds of years. So it was hard to expunge. And German nationalism could be strongly anti-Semitic. Having said that, there are strains of liberal German nationalism in the 1800s that are totally anti-anti-Semitic. That to be a good German is to be an anti-anti-Semite. Because the Jews and the German, you know, well, the Jews and the Germans is an interesting concept. German Jews and German Christians 
right, are all united in a single country. And the best example of this is, and I was mentioning earlier to a student, this guy Brian Porter, Polish historian at uh, Michigan, wrote a book some years back called When Nationalism Begins to Hate. And he writes about Polish nationalism from the mid-1800s to the early 1900s. And Polish nationalism in the mid-1800s is very strongly, you know, very fervent. But there's room for Jews. It's like we are Poles. And the Jews and the Catholics were all, you know, united together in a great Polish effort. In the 1863 rebellion against Russia, for example. And then it morphs into something else in which to be a Pole is to be anti-Ukrainian or to be anti-Jewish or whatever. So the, the question's going to be why and when is it that nationalism feels the need not to incorporate the Jew as a fundamental component who has something to offer, as was the case in Poland, say, in 1863, and the Jew becomes actually a source of defining I am what I am because I'm not a Jew, which is a very important part, say, of Nazi anti-Semitism. So that's the question when the anti-Semitism makes that, uh, that change. And thanks for the reference to Norwell. That's really cool. See, there's no such thing as an original idea. Oh, well. <laughs> I, just, I wanted to follow up about what you just said about um, American nationalism not historically giving rise to anti-Semitism. What about like white nationalism in America that's pro-Zionist because yeah. we see Israel as this paragon of an ethno state? Right. And like, do you see examples in your research of, histo of historical figures who are pro-Zionist anti-Semites? And is there a narrative to be told about that that spans? Yeah. Generations and, and countries? Yeah, I think so. I think so. I mean, first off, I mean, I would never say there's this kind of controversy among people who do American Jewish history. Those who say America's different and they never really had anti Semitism, unlike Europe. And there's a whole younger generation of American Jewish historians who want to, you know, say, no, how horrible it's been. And then there's been, you know, a great deal of anti Semitism in the United States. Of course, the United States has had considerable anti-Semitism. I was just talking uh, with my 90-year-old mother uh, about her, um, I guess it was uh, my stepfather who passed away recently, he, his experiences in the Second World War in the Army. And you talk, I don't know if there's anybody here the right age who served in the Second World War. You have any veterans here? Because I've talked to a lot of Jews who served in the Second World War, and some of them say, you know, it was fine or whatever. A lot of them talk about the anti-Semitism they experienced. And, you know, usually from enlisted men, not from officers. And there have been more than one case I've heard of a Jewish soldier in World War II who has an altercation with an anti-Semitic young man from, I don't know, the American South or something, and the Jew hits him with a shovel. Well, that was my mother's partner. Um, it was a long time ago. Hits him with a shovel or whatever, and the commanding officer has to punish the Jewish soldier, but gives him a nominal punishment, because actually he's quite happy that the Jew did it. So uh, there's lots of anti-Semitism in this country's history. Uh, but, you know, when you think about what I said earlier in my talk about how the early anti-Semites thought Zionism was kind of neat, it'll get rid of the Jews. And although Drummond did not use the language of white supremacists, white supremacists today, and I prefer that term white supremacy over white nationalism because I think white nationalism is a kind of a whitewashing of the term. Um, yeah, you could maybe draw a typology where it'll serve our interests uh, but also the sense of respect. They're admitting that they're not like us. They're admitting that they're different. They're admitting that they don't belong. So I'm not saying it's exactly the same, but that would be a really interesting project to look at this language of you know, respect for Zionism that's combined with anti-Semitism in this earlier period that I mentioned and comparing it, let's say, with more contemporary developments. That would be a great research essay. back to the idea of um, the question of the relationship between uh, anti-Semitism and Zionism. And so sort of you mentioned that you don't think that it's um, the, main, the main driving force. And so this isn't me so much pushing, pushing back against that, but just more to um, want to hear your thoughts on what do you sort of, in the absence of anti-Semitism, what do you think would drive that, uh, you mentioned sort of uh, was mentioned of like this idea of like a folk or of uh, a spiritual nation. I was wondering, what do you think, in the absence of anti-Semitism, what would drive uh, that sense of a spiritual yeah. nation into the very material? Uh, yeah, I, I just don't think that. And then again, this is now not just counterfactual history, but it's speculative, which is different. 
No, I don't think it would be enough. I mean, you know, what are the factors that made possible, and I'm not making any political judgments here, it's just what are the factors that made possible the creation of the Jewish national home in the state of Israel? I mean, obviously, there's the Balfour Declaration in and of itself is a piece of paper. That's all it is. There is a mass movement of Jews in East Central and Eastern Europe it begins before World War I, it becomes much stronger after World War I. They need a place to go. Most of the Jews who wind up in Palestine in the interwar period are not idealist Zionists, they're refugees. And during the war, and there's a brilliant new doctoral thesis by Gil Rubin of Columbia University, it's a really interesting argument, that at the very beginning of the war, Czech and Polish leaders all agreed that the massive demographic dislocation that's occurred, the Jews are not coming back that the Jews will be kept out of the, the post-war Poland or Czechoslovakia or whatever. And Jabotinsky, by the way, Vladimir Jabotinsky knew this, and David uh, Ben-Gurion and Chaim Weizmann knew this. And that's why in the early years of World War II, they say we must have a Jewish state, not, I don't know, a province or not a colony or not, I don't know, something in the British, uh, part of the British Empire. We need a state, we need sovereignty in all of historic Palestine because we have to house millions of Jewish refugees. Then what, that's the Biltmore program of 1942 reflects that view. But then what happens? They learn of the full extent of the Holocaust. Two thirds of the Jews of Europe are obliterated. Okay. Our, we've lost our demographic uh, reserve, but we need a state for, you know, to accommodate those who were left. And they start talking about other sources. You know, there's, um, a, there are anti-Jewish riots in Morocco, for example, 1940, early 1948. So they say, okay, we need a Jewish state, but we talk about now partition. And the whole idea of partition is not something necessarily foisted upon the Zionists. They actually are kind of interested in partition because they don't need all of Palestine anymore because so many Jews have died. And that might be a counterintuitive argument because people often say the Holocaust is what gave the Zionist movement its uh, legitimacy. But in some ways it undercut the Zionist movement because it killed the demographic reservoir. So the point is you have these geopolitical realities that give rise to Zionism, push it along, help account for the UN partition resolution, and then you have a war. And that's just a war. You have a, a, a either you can call it an anti-colonial war or a post-colonial war, but you have a war in Palestine, and then you have the creation of a state. So these are things that have nothing to do, really, with um, what I was talking about today. They, these are just geopolitical facts on the ground. If it hadn't been for this, and this is another brilliant thing about Gill's thesis, I don't mean to plagiarize, so I'm quoting from him. He writes, that we tend to look at the history of Israel teleologically, like there was the state in the making, you know, Herzl, Weizmann, Ben-Gurion, state. He says, no, it was all contingent. It could easily have gone the other way. You know, if any of those variables had been changed along the way, there might not have been a Jewish state. But history played out the way it did. The state was created, it established itself. And once states are created, and once they've attained a certain critical mass of power and stability, it's hard to get rid of them. It takes a long, long time. Then you start thinking in terms of scores of years or centuries rather than years. So um, I hope that answers the question. But it's, it's, it's a, and I encourage that way of thinking. So thank you. Thank okay. you for thank a you. wonderful talk. Thank you. Thank you all for your comments and your questions. <laughs>